That's one of my favorite songs there. And evidently I like it so much I didn't even get to one with lyrics. Sorry about that. Um, this has nothing to do with the message, but but we're I've said this before, we're living in some of the, the hardest times that there ever was to be encouraged about much of anything. And I keep thinking about that song New Wine, and I did the short version of it just because I didn't, you know. But I'm telling you, it was it was very moving for that song because to get this new wine that everybody wants, it's not gonna come easy. You know, just like we talked about with the lyrics before, and I'm still gonna do it, I promise you I'm going to, but the lyrics say that in the crushing and in the pressing, you are making new wine. So these hard times and stuff that we're going through, I mean, we've got to have these things to get this new wine. It's just, it's necessary. It's got to happen. But I was thinking about um, a message and I'm going to do my best. It's in Matthew chapter 16 this morning. And um, God truly has been so good to me, even even through everything, he has still been good to me. But in Matthew chapter number 16, starting in verse 13, I'm going to read something this morning, and I'm going to ask you a question at the end of it. And it's the same question that Jesus asked his disciples. And I would, I would think that this is not me asking you this question as a disciple. This is picture Jesus asking you this question. Uh, because it's very important on where we go from, from here. It's very important on where you go for the rest of your day, uh, for the rest of your week, and for the rest of your life. But in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, the Bible says that when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah. Or one of the other prophets. But then he said unto them. But who do you say that I am? And may God add his blessing. To the reading of his word this morning. And that's the question that I wanted to ask you. Who do you say that Jesus is this morning? Who, who is Jesus to you this morning? Because who he is to you. May not be exactly who he is to me. Now at the end of it. We can all say that he's my savior and he's my God and he's all these things but to some people he seems to mean a little bit more to than others people who uh, and this is the unfortunate reality of it is people who have been brought up in church all their lives and have seemingly never been exposed to things in the world it's almost like they become numb to who Jesus really is it's like they become numb to what God really did but then you take the people who have stepped out into the world and have been through all the hell and the havoc that hell can throw at you. And then they get a taste of Jesus. They don't seem to forget quite as quickly as people who've been born and raised in church, so to speak. And that doesn't take anything away from those who have been born and raised in church because I was one of those. I did step out of church for a little while and I did get crazy in the world and all this and that kind of stuff. But seemingly people get numb to the power of Jesus. And to the power of God. And what, what scares me about that is maybe that's why we don't see some of the miracles that he promised we could see. Yeah. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't see the breakthroughs that we see that he promised that would happen for us. Maybe it's because we don't really know who he is to us. Right. Maybe we need to be taken back to that moment where we found out who he was. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't there when you got saved. Well, some of you all were, but I wasn't there the day that you received Christ into your heart. I don't know what you were going through at that moment. I don't know how refreshing it was to feel the peace and the joy of God come upon your life. I can't take you back to that moment, but you can. See, a lot of people will tell you not to worry about your past, but I think we should for a moment just to remember where God has brought you from. So I can ask you this morning, just like Jesus did the disciples, who do you say that he is? Who is he to you? And, and I don't care where you've been or what you've gone through. God can use you. I told you that before. You see in, the, in, in this scripture right here that he didn't choose the smartest ones. The answer was in the question. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? He gave them the answer and they still didn't get it right. So God can use you, right? So he brings them to um, Caesarea Philippi here. 
And and to know what this place is is it's like um, it's where a bunch of idols and rich, uh, rivals and stuff are taking place. Gods that had hands that couldn't feel, and gods that had eyes that couldn't see. And and he brings them in. This is an old place to where the Caesarian uh, Baal god was was worshipped, and there was all kinds of temples and stuff at Philippi. And then he brings them into this one place. This is where the the god Pan was birthed in Philippi, right? It's the god of nature. So it's almost like Jesus brings them here for a purpose. And he has a purpose in everything that he does. So he brings them here and there's like this big marble temple that has been put here for Caesar. And in all of its splendor, it just seems like Jesus brings them here with a backdrop behind him to go against all of the world's religions at that time and all the other gods for the disciples to give him an answer. It was a pointed question. And he wanted a pointed answer. See, that's where a lot of people don't understand today. There's some things that you can skate around. There's some things that you can take a back seat on. There's some things that you can remain silent on and not give your opinion, right? One is politics, you know? You don't have to like this one or you don't have to like that one. And if you do, you can secretly do it and it's going to be okay. The same thing with sports teams. You know, if you like the Georgia Bulldog, maybe so, you know. Do you like the, the, the Bama? Mm -mm. No, it's just not going to happen, right? So there's things that you can take a stance on and things that you don't have to take a stance on. This is one thing that you will have to give a pointed answer at some point in your life. The Bible says it plain and clear that the end of time will come when every year has had a chance to hear the gospel. And then in that day, it's going to be too late. So we're going to have to hear this pointed answer or question from Jesus at some point in our life and you've got to give him an answer. You're either going to say two things. You are the great I am or you're one of the biggest frauds that there ever was in the world. And when you reject Jesus, that's basically what you're saying is you're a fraud, you're a phony and what you said and what you did all those years ago mean nothing. That's what you're saying. Maybe not you, but somebody's going to hear this later probably, right? So there was a pointed question here that he asked them and he wanted a pointed answer, but I feel like that there was a reason for the backdrop. He wanted to, to maybe make him second guess himself. Well, there's a God right there and then there's a God right there. and then, no, 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 no. He did that on purpose. And I think that today people are going through the same thing. There's tons of gods in the backdrop. Tons of them. The lake, your phone, a dance, a cookout. All these things that you put before God are your new God. Maybe brief, I don't know. But that's how it works. So God wants to be the forefront and everything else in the background. And he's asking you, who do men say that I am? So I'm asking you, who do you say that God is to you this morning? And before you answer that, if I could, I'm going to take us back to the cross. And I know you're thinking, well, Easter was last week. No, I celebrate the cross still. Yeah. I celebrate the tomb still. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a, a, a question. And, and before you answer that, I'm going to take you back to the cross. No doubt I'm just painting a picture. I wasn't there. And the Bible gives some input on what happened that day, but it doesn't go into great detail. So I'm just going to try to paint you a picture of who was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was hanging on it. And I want to ask them who they think Jesus is. What do they think about this man being crucified? So just think for just a minute, there's all kinds of yelling and screaming and there's blood running down our Savior and, and, and there's people everywhere. Some are cussing at him. Some are screaming at him. Some are probably weeping and crying and Wondering why did this have to happen even though he said it did. But then if we can interview one, one man, we'll run up to him and say, Sir, what, what is your name? Sir, what do you think about this man named Jesus that's being crucified? What do you say about him? And he says, Well, my name is Bartimaeus. You see, it wasn't that long ago that I was a blind beggar sitting on the side of the road. My daddy was a beggar. We were both beggars and I was sitting on the side of the road. In Jericho. 
And I heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming by. And I knew that this was my only time for me to get my, my life in, in, in right. Going the right way. I knew that this was the only way. So, sir, what happened? Sir, what happened? Well, when he began walking by, I, be, I began screaming his name out. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Sir, then, then what happened to you, sir? The people that were around me told me to be quiet. And I couldn't be screaming and yelling like that. Sir, what was your response to that? I yelled even louder. This is, this is biblical. This is exactly what happened in Bartimaeus' life. And then Jesus stopped and spoke to him and told him that his faith had healed him and he regained his sight. That's all he wanted was he wanted his sight back. He regained his sight. So that, that man there, he could say, I don't know why they're crucifying Jesus. This is what he done for me. He didn't do anything wrong. I don't know why they're crucifying him. And many times people would refer to him as blind Bartimaeus. Why? Many times people refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas. Why? That's not who they are. Bartimaeus was blind, but he is not blind anymore. Thomas did doubt, but he doesn't doubt anymore. How would we feel if people would tell us who we are? Look, there's that whoremonger. Oh, whoremonger John. Remember him? There's that dope head of John. Remember him? That ain't who I am anymore. That's not who Bartimaeus is anymore. He's not blind Bartimaeus. He has his sight. So then he went over to the next person. He said, ma'am, 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 what do you think about this man Jesus? Ma'am, what do you think about him? Well, well, my name is Mary Magdalene. There was a time that she had all kinds of things going wrong in her life. She was deceptive and she had seven demons inside of her life that Christ cast out. And as soon as he cast them out, she became one of his most faithful followers all the way until the resurrection. So, ma'am, what do you say? What do you say about him? I don't know why they're crucifying this man. I don't know why. So picture yourself. Where would you be? Where, where are you? Where do you fit into this puzzle? What has he done for you? Where has he brought you from? And you run over to the next guy and say, sir, sir, let me, let me talk to you for just a second, sir. So what do you think about this man that's hanging on this cross right here? What do you say about him? Who do you say that he is? He said, well, my name is Jay Iris. Not long ago, my 12-year-old daughter was dead. And this man came into her room while she lay dead on her bed. And he said, Talithi Akumai, and she rose. That means arise. To me, that's what the church needs to do today. You know, we don't need to be like Bartimaeus to where people are just like, y'all need to hush and be quiet. No, that's not what God is looking for. He's looking for a people that's going to praise his name and that's going to raise him up and it's going to lift the banner and not cower down to the world and, and tuck back into a cave. But Jay Iris was like, I don't know why they're killing this man. He did nothing wrong. My daughter Jenny is alive and she's here today because of him. I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Would, would it be possible that when you begin to think about the world and what the world is doing today, are they not re-crucifying Jesus and, and just putting him away and just killing him and, and we're just standing by just like the other religious people did back then and just watching? It's, it's sad to think of that, but it's, it's happening. And I know that we can't do so much. We can do all that we can do. But God has never done everything that he's ever done. He can do more. So then you look at this other lady that's hiding over in the corner in the shadows and say, ma'am, come out of the shadows, ma'am. Man, what do you say about this man named Jesus that's hanging on the cross? What, what do you say about him? What do you think about him? Well, my name's not important. But I can tell you that the Pharisees caught me in the middle of an act of adultery a long time ago. And they brought me to trial and threw me at his feet. And I can only tell you what he did for me. He didn't condemn me. He didn't persecute me. 
He loved me. He gave me grace. He gave me mercy. He gave me forgiveness. I don't know why they're crucifying this man. I don't get it. He didn't do anything. So then you ask this other guy running around here, sir, sir, what do you think? What does Jesus mean to you? Well, my name is Lazarus. I'm not even supposed to be here. See, I got sick and I died and I was in a tomb for four days and my whole family said that I was stinking. But this man that's hanging on the cross came to the mouth of my grave and spoke my name and life came back into me. Could you imagine where he was at at the moment? He was probably in Abraham's bosom, just like the other, you know, with the rich man and Lazarus situation there. Could you imagine he was probably chilling out with Abraham and Isaac and him and just talking about the good times and how he finally made it home and all this and that. And then he hears something in his ear and he's like, hold up, I got to go. Jesus is calling my name. You know, I was a Lazarus at one time and Jesus called my name. And you were a Lazarus at one time and Jesus called your name. So who do you say that Jesus is to you? And then the reporter is probably looking at him and saying, sir, can you calm down? Can you, can you pull it together? You're on national television right now. You need to chill out. That's what happens. I don't want any of you to misunderstand why Brian Kemp was here in the church. And we prayed for him and prayed with him. And I gave him uh, this little 30 second speech about it was not about Brian Kemp. It was an opportunity for me to give God the glory for what he's done in Louisville, Georgia. He just chose to use Brian Kemp in that moment to do it. So now you ask all these people and you're just like, well, well, who do you say that he is? We, we, we need to get back and remember who Jesus is to us. He's asking us this morning. He's like, well, who do you say that I am? And if these interviews of these people weren't quite enough, then I can only tell you what the Bible says about who he is. The Bible in Daniel chapter 9 says that he's the Messiah. And the, in Isaiah, he's known as the King of Glory. In John 8, he's known as the I Am. In Revelation 1, he's known as the Alpha and Omega. In John 1, 29, he's known as the Lamb of God. In Revelation 22, he's known as the Root of David. John 10, he's known as the Good Shepherd. John 1, he's known as the Word. Isaiah chapter 4, he's known as the branch, Luke 24, the prophet, Revelation 22 and 16, the morning star. John is the light of the world. Isaiah, the arm of God. John 6, the way. Isaiah 59, redeemer. Luke 1, the horn of salvation. He's anything that we need him to be. Anything that we need him to be. All of this is, is in the Bible. If you don't like their testimonies, all of this is in the Bible. In 1 Timothy, he's known as the gate. In John 6, the bread of life. In John 1, Emmanuel. Luke 1, Prince of Peace. Luke chapter 2 is known as the Savior. But when you get to Matthew chapter 2, he's known as the King of Kings. Now, I know how y'all are in the South. I mean, I've been here for like 25 years, so you might as well say I'm from the South. But there was a time that I lived up North. And I know down here, y'all don't play much chess. Many of you don't. Probably some of you never heard of it. Daniel's heard of it. It's for smart people. That's why I'll tell you. See, see, checkers, you even have checkers at Cracker Barrel. You go eat their meatloaf and you just jump here and down there and take your neighbor's piece and it is what it is, right? There's not a whole lot to checkers. Checkers is fast paced. There's not a whole lot of thought to it. But chess is different. Chess is much different. Chess is a slower paced game and it takes lots of thought and then a movement. I remember playing chess and learning how to play chess when I was a kid because I didn't have Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 17 and Xbox 400. I didn't have all that. So we had to get creative. Well, this chess game come along and it was something simple. Once you learn it, right? You got the pawns that are up front and you got the rooks and the bishops and the queen and the king and the knights and you have all these pieces, right? I don't know. This is just me. When I think of the king of kings, this is just what it makes me think of. And the object of, of chess is to get the king, your opponent's king, in a total position of surrender and defeat. He's vulnerable. He has nobody else to protect him. He can't go right. He can't go left. 
He can't go frontwards or backwards. He can't go anywhere, but he's defeated right where he's at. That's the, the, the idea of chess. And then at the end of that, the person who has the king in that total position of surrender and defeat says the words, checkmate. That means that you have no way out. That means that the game is over. That means that the time has come. Let's start over. The game is over. We are living in a time today where the enemy says checkmate in our life. He wants, to, he wants to put us in a position of defeat and total surrender and thinking that we have no way out. Some of you are living in it right now where you feel like it's a checkmate moment and you have no way out of your life right now. There's this barrier that's right in front of you. You don't know whether you can go left or you don't know whether you can go right or you might not even be able to go. You've got to go straight. But you feel like you can't and in your ear the enemy is saying checkmate. You're done. It's over with. But I remember that the children of Israel found themselves in a similar situation. They had been held captive for years by the Egyptians. And all of a sudden this man named Moses says, all right, y'all load up. We're going. Let's go. So then they, they take off. And then they get down to the big old Red Sea. And they're just sitting there. They can't go forward. They can't go to the left because there's a mountain. They can't go to the right because there's a mountain. They look behind them and here comes the Egyptian army with Pharaoh and all of them just closing in on them. And in this moment, they're just like, God, what did you do to us? What did you do? And then I know that the enemy in this moment right here is probably whispering in every one of the Israelites' ears, check me. You were set up for failure. Got you right where I want you. But I got to show you something. Every year they have a major tournament. I think it's in Europe. And this painting was on display. And at the bottom of the painting it says checkmate. And the storyline goes that the guy on the left with the green garb and the red feather is depicted as the devil. And the guy on the right has found himself in a situation where he has no way to go. He's in a position of defeat. The game is over. His life is over. They were gambling for his life and he lost. Or so the painting depicted. Well, during one of the breaks of the tournament, one of the master chess players was walking around just observing the beautiful paintings and and then right in the middle of the tournament, he, he stops and he just begins to study this one here. And he began to notice the pieces that were left remaining. And you can see, if you look closely at this guy in the grin, he's got a small grin on his face. He just whispered checkmate in the ear of that young man sitting across from him. And you can see the despair on this guy's face, the concern, the worry. Put yourself in that seat right there. You ever felt like that? And the enemy tells you checkmate. So this guy's looking at this and he's studying it. Now right in the middle of the tournament, he starts screaming and he starts yelling and he says, no, whoever painted this, painted it all wrong. He told him, he said, the king has one more move. That's what he told him. And I think that that's the notice that we need to serve the enemy when he whispers in our ear, checkmate. I don't think so. The king has one more move for our life. That's where the children of Israel found themselves. He said, checkmate. And they said, I don't think so. The king has one more move. And then Moses parted the Red Sea with the power of God. It wasn't just him. So this is where we find ourselves a lot of times is in this position of checkmate. But the king does have one more move for your life. Why? Because, I, because you're still here. You're still breathing. You're not dead. There's a reason that you're here. That's something that we throw out there like a cliche for some reason, and I don't know why, but we just do. But it's the truth. If you are still sitting here breathing, there is a reason for your life. Even the dog said so. There's a reason for you being here. So when you get in that point of feeling like you're in checkmate and the enemy has you defeated and has you right where he wants you 
and you feel like you don't have any way out and you feel like it's over. You know, there's people in this community. We, we, we had another suicide just two days ago. We've had three of them uh, within three months, within a quarter of a mile of each other. There's people that feel like that is the only way out of the life. It's not. It's not. We, we all go through some very tough times. I, I look at this church a lot of times and I'm just like, God, I know what you told me. I'm still here. We're less than two weeks away or yeah, right at two weeks away from being two years at this thing. We're not forcing anything. I'm not forcing anything. I'm allowing God to do this. So just so y'all know, don't, don't you do this, okay? But just so y'all know, if you don't pay another dime in your tithes and your offerings, we can sit right here for a year and never have to worry about leaving. Our bills are paid for a year, just so y'all know, okay? God is not taken off guard on what's going on here. We have to continue to stay faithful and keep showing up and keep pressing in. Well, there's something that's going to break. I'm telling you it is. There's, a, there's only so many times that you can hit the dam before the dam is going to break. We've seen pieces chip off of it before. We've seen it. But when that dam breaks, you better be ready. You better be ready. So I just wanted to encourage you this morning. I'm going to get you out of here by 12 o'clock so your chicken don't get cold. First time ever. But I wanted to encourage you that when you feel like you're in a position of defeat, you're not. The enemy can say checkmate over your life. It's our job as a church to welcome these people in. It just is. There, there's people that are going to come in with addictions and people that have been trafficked and people that have been uh, sleeping with this one and sleeping with that one and all this and that. You know, It's the church's job when they feel like it's at the end to say, I don't think so. The king has another move. So I want us to be that church. And I had to ask you, who do you say that Jesus is this morning to you? Who is he to you? What has he done for you in your life? Amen. Let's all stand. I'm going to do that so good. So I'm going to do